Welcome to the Landmark Theatre's Q&A podcast. In this episode, moderator Pete Hammond sits down with former Vice President Al Gore at the Landmark Theatre in Los Angeles to discuss his new documentary about climate change, an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power. Thank you. Wow. You're a movie star again. Uh, <laughs> it's you and Wonder Woman this summer, but uh, you're both superheroes in your own way. Um, and uh, that brings me to the idea now that you're, you're back with this 10 years later, a decade later after the first one. And why now? Why was the time right? To, did you decide to go back to the movies with this, this message? Well, it's a great question. Before I answer, uh, uh, Pete, let me thank you for doing this. And I, I just wanted to briefly acknowledge a longtime friend, Ted Mundorf, who's the president and CEO of Ted's right Land- there. Landmark Theaters. Thank you <laughs> very much, Ted. And uh, thank you all for coming and watching this. Ten years uh, seemed like a good uh, milestone where we could ask the audience for permission to say what's new. And in fact, uh, there have been at least two huge changes in the decade since the first movie. Number one, the climate-related extreme weather events uh, have become a lot more common, unfortunately, a lot more destructive. There are 100 fires out there today. Um, Just in the last seven years in the U.S. alone, there have been 11 once-in-a-thousand-year events. But the second big change in the last decade is that the solutions are here now. And 10 years ago, you could see them on the horizon, and yet you had to rely on the technology experts to assure you that they're coming, they're going to be here. And it's, it's, it's a big change when they're here, like in Georgetown, Texas, and oh, yeah. like in so many places now where electricity from solar and wind is cheaper than electricity from dirty fossil fuels. And that makes a huge difference. It, it, it makes it possible to, to win this. We just have to win it fast enough. What struck me about the movie and watching the movie was its optimism and your optimism. Uh, the first one, you know, you're going kind of horrified as you're showing all these things. And here you're showing kind of what we've done and what we can still do here. Yeah, in, in spite of, uh, of Donald Trump, the, the Paris Agreement was really an historic breakthrough for the entire world. Uh, And with the technology solutions I mentioned a moment ago, and with the popular rise in support for really taking this on, I'm convinced that we we really can solve this. We're we're making a lot of progress. We're not making progress fast enough, but there was a a great economist years ago, uh, the late Rudy Dornbush, who once wrote, uh, things take longer to happen than you think they will but then they happen much faster than you thought they ever could. (laughs) And, you know, it's so true in life of a lot of things. It's certainly true of these technology curves, but it's also true of these great social revolutions that advance the cause of humanity. Uh, Just to pick one example, uh, if somebody had told me even five years ago that gay marriage would be legal in all 50 states in the U.S., and would be uh, accepted and honored and celebrated by two-thirds of the American people, I, I would have said, well, I sure hope so, but w- what are you smoking? Um, it didn't s- d- wouldn't have seemed likely. But it happened so quickly because it became resolved into a binary choice between right and, right and wrong. A- and that's what happened with the other movements I mentioned in the movie, the abolition movement, the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement. Nelson Mandela once said of the anti-apartheid movement, it's always impossible until it's done. And we are at that tipping point now with the climate movement. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, and of course, this movie premiered uh, at Sundance. And since then, they've had to change the ending, sadly, here. Um, This is a continuing uh, thing here, and I think it's a very powerful way to end the movie now and and to keep it going. But um, that whole thing was not expected, was it? Uh, You know, no one expected Donald Trump to be elected president and then to follow through. 
Well, we weren't sure how the election was going to come out. I, 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 I was not sure. Um, but the three, bon, bon, Bonnie Cohen and John Schenck, the directors of this movie, I know I'm incredibly biased, but I think they've done a spectacular job. And the three of us talked for a long time about the fact that we would have to wait uh, to know the outcome of the election, to know what the winner would actually do, and then to wait to see what all that felt like. You know, where are we? And so we did anticipate uh, that even after the festival premiere at Sundance in January that we would have to continue uh, editing the movie. I say we, they're the ones that are responsible for the... <laughs> and he also shot, John also shot the film. John too, Schenck was the cinematographer for the entire film. Absolutely beautiful cinematography. Um, and um, so it's their movie. It's a good thing I didn't have Final Cut because... Uh, <laughs> There, you know, in my mind, I'm younger and thinner, and uh, <laughs> I, a lot of those. Uh, I, there, there would have been a lot of that stuff on the cutting room floor, but, but, uh, but, but in any case, um, they they did a great job in integrating the uh, the the events uh, after the election and the speech of June 1st. And you know, when Trump made that speech, I really was concerned. The reason I spent so much time trying to get him to come to his senses, and I was clearly wrong that he might, but, but, uh, <laughs> don't get me started. Um, oh, no, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm tempted, but I'm not. <laughs> uh, but when he made that speech, um, I, I was really worried that uh, other countries, and I had a few in mind, might use that as an excuse to pull out of the Paris Agreement themselves. But right after his speech, the entire rest of the world doubled down on their commitments and they're going to move even faster now. You know, it's almost as if the rest of the world was saying, we'll show you, Donald Trump. And, uh, and then here in this country, Governor, starting, by the way, with your fantastic Governor Jerry Brown here in California. Man. <laughs> he 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 came down from Sacramento last night for the red carpet event and an act of friendship. It was really <laughs> super nice of him to do. But the legislation he passed was really historic just just in the past week, uh, and he got eight Republican members of the legislature, some from very conservative uh, districts, to support this. But other governors uh, also: Jay Inslee from Washington, uh, Andy Cuomo in New York. There's a long list of them. And, and mayors, uh, the list of mayors endorsing the Paris Agreement, you know, <laughs> in his speech, Trump said, I was elected to be the mayor of Pittsburgh, not Paris. And you may <laughs> saw the next, you may have seen the, ne the next day, the mayor of Pittsburgh said, well, I am the mayor of Pittsburgh. <laughs> And we are in the Paris Agreement, <laughs> and we're going 100% renewable. And and the, you saw the mayor of Georgetown, Texas. That I mean, great. Yeah, and Atlanta just uh, decided to go 100% renewable. You've been to Atlanta? I, I, I've yeah. been to Atlanta. My wife's from Atlanta right there. Well, if Atlanta, <laughs> if Atlanta can go 100% renewable, any city can go uh, 100 <laughs> Anyway, and business leaders, you know, Apple, Google, there's a very long list. And so now... It really looks as if the U.S. is going to meet our commitments under the Paris Agreement, in spite of what Donald Trump thinks, does, says, and tweets. Yeah. That's a heartening thing, and I like what that said. You know, in spite of if he's not going to lead, we will lead. Yeah, and, yeah. and you you are now, I mean, I really wish you were elected president, but you weren't. But... What you've done since then, you've actually gone beyond that. You're the leader of a movement, mm. and, uh, and that's an extraordinary thing to be able to do. There's a lot of power in that, too, I think, you know, in energizing people here. Winston Churchill once lost an election as a young man, and one of his friends said, Winston, this is a blessing in disguise. And he said, damn good disguise. <laughs> and... Uh, I mean, trust me, I'm under no illusion that there's any position with as much power to change the world for the good as that of president. But or the bad, apparently. Well, well, there you go. Um, luckily, they're uh, uh, mixing malevolence with incompetence, so there, there's a, a, a limit to. Uh, but uh, oh well. Uh, speaking of tweets, please be careful. 
<laughs> anyway, um, I'm grateful to have found other ways to to try to make the world a better place, and it, it really is a privilege to have work that feels like it justifies pouring everything you got into it. So I'm going to keep going. The power of movies yeah. is extraordinary, and you've yeah. discovered that. You discovered it 10 years ago. In fact, the first one won two Oscars. And, and then you won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, really a fantastic. Thank, thank uh, <laughs> and all for this, and the power of movies is extraordinary because people, people listen, and, and, yeah. and, and that can make a huge difference doing it this yeah, way. Yeah, I think in some ways this may be the golden age of documentary film, and maybe the noisy communications environment we live in now with the, you know, the, all the... Uh, iPhones beeping and buzzing and the social media and the 8,000 commercials a day on TV and everybody's always getting all this stuff. And so when you go into a theater and sit in a, in a community setting like this and give your attention for 90 to 100 minutes to a well thought out, uh, deeply fact checked uh, presentation, it's kind of a unique uh, way to, 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 to get a... Uh, a director or the director's understanding of what they're trying to say that doesn't exist in any other medium now. So uh, it's been a privilege for me to work with uh, Bonnie and John and participant media here in uh, L.A. Ha has a, such a commitment to positive uh, movies to make the world a better place. Paramount has just gone all out for this movie, and all the people in Paramount have really really uh, put their shoulders to the wheel and and uh, it's it's been great it's like everybody who's been involved with this movie uh, has uh, you know so many of them come up to me and describe this they, they have uh, really given of themselves it, it uh, and you can feel it in all the events everything they've done and I hope that those of you who f uh, feel this movie is worthwhile will reach out to others and, and uh, spread the word of mouth and get people to come to the theaters because the, the more people who see this, then the more people uh, join the movement that we need. The website is inconveniencesequel.com and people can buy tickets there. Uh, and uh, there's a book of the same name that's uh, out. 100% of the profits go to the Climate Reality Project to train more climate activists uh, around the world. So. Um, help us out. Uh, the title, Inconvenient, obviously, Inconvenient Truth, Inconvenient Sequel. I think right now this was really a convenient sequel, considering everything that happened and the way it's come out now at this time. Um, just to remind everybody, you know, because 10 years ago, what happened right after that movie came out? There was so much attention to it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, it fades a little bit in people's memories, and you have to... Yeah. You have to go back. Yeah, I think the Great Recession uh, r really uh, blunted the momentum. People were deeply concerned about the economy. And, and another thing, uh, in, in January of 2009, that's when the Tea Party movement was launched. Uh, and s some of it was genuine uh, uh, grassroots uh, unrest, for sure. But, but some of it also was financed by carbon polluters that Koch brothers put up most of the money for it. They're the ones that registered the URL for Tea Party. Uh, and this, uh, they, took a, they took the playbook from the tobacco companies. And I think everybody knows that story when the doctors linked cigarettes to lung cancer and other diseases. The tobacco companies hired actors and dressed them up as doctors and put them in front of cameras to falsely reassure people that what the Surgeon General and the doctors and scientists were saying wasn't true. And the large carbon polluters have hired the same PR firms. It's all been documented. And they've spent a ton of money trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. And they've tried to use it as a divisive partisan issue, uh, like it's a tribal warfare kind of thing. And, and yet you see Mayor Dale, Dale Ross in, in Georgetown, uh, and I could pick out some other Republican mayors around the country who are uh, traveling the same road and they're saying hey wait a minute this is not political it's not partisan we got a problem on our hands and we have a great opportunity we can lower people's electric bills and 
uh, you know, the air gets a little cleaner, and a side benefit is we save the future of humanity. <laughs> not bad, right? Not bad. <laughs> I love that mayor. He, yeah, he yeah. was, for a conservative Republican, he yeah. was, you know. But that shows, you know, we, we've, we live in a time where there's just such a divide. I mean, I've, I've never seen it like this, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And, 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 and the last thing they want to do, apparently, in Congress is actually work together. That's the last thing that he says he'll go to, is try to bring the Democrats into this process. Oh, gee you know. whiz. You mean the way our founders intended. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. astounding how we got to this point. I don't know. Yeah. Well, um, as I say, there's been an intentional effort to, to produce this division and the anti-climate fervor. Uh, in my native Tennessee, there's an old saying, if you see a... Oh, really? Oh, good. Right here? There's an old, <laughs> there's an old saying... Uh, in Tennessee, that if, if you see a turtle on top of a fence post, you can be pretty sure it did not get there by itself. Uh -huh. And if you see this kind of uh, bitterness and vitriol aimed at anybody who wants to solve the climate crisis, you can be pretty sure that didn't happen by accident either. They've, they've uh, financed a, a little cottage industry out there of phony scientists and phony deniers creating false doubts. and. You know, they, they want to fool people. They want to pull the wool over your eyes. But more and more people are seeing through it. Uh, one reason is there's a new participant in this discussion. Turns out uh, with a more powerful voice than any of us have, Mother Nature. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, every night on the TV news is like a nature hike through the Book of Revelation, as I've said. Uh, and just in this country, in seven years, last seven years, there have been 11 once in a thousand year events. Hottest year ever last year, second hottest year before, third hottest year before that. I mean, the pattern is really clear. There are, there are about 100 fires raging out there right now. Um, I've, I've, I've been asked a couple of times in different interviews, you think it'll take some major event to wake people up? And I said, well, I don't know. What about losing most of the city of New Orleans? What about... Uh, Flooding the 9-11 War Memorial site in half of uh, Manhattan. What about, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> these things are happening now. And, and people are beginning to connect the dots, for sure. I saw you standing. You've got a, quite a, a lot of footage there in Florida. And if anybody had a reason to be bitter about Florida, as you indicated in the film, <laughs> it, it's, it's you. But oh, No, I love Florida. I carried Florida. Yeah. You Pretty did. Sure. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but you're there trying to help Florida, and you're and you and you and uh, watching that those floods and things, and what, the thing you mentioned about the governor, you yeah. know, being able to drive through that and not do anything yeah. or deny it, it's pretty astounding. Yeah, and, and ordering all of the state employees never to use the phrase global warming. You know, the, it's true. Absolutely. Uh, and and uh, that's true in other some other states led by climate deniers. The truth about the climate crisis is still inconvenient for the large carbon polluters. So they just want to snuff it out and smother it with all these phony false doubts. And that's yet another reason why a film like that uh, can kind of push through all that phony dialogue and, and go straight to people with a, an honest and compelling presentation of what we're facing, including the fact that the solutions really are here now. Yeah, and, uh, and we're all now educated on that, which is the great thing. I would never be able to follow all this. I don't know how you learned all this, you know, over the course of it and kept it straight because it's, it's complicated as it goes on uh, country by country, state yeah. by state. Everybody's got their own problems. The stuff about India was fascinating, actually. Yeah, and it only took me 40 years. <laughs> when did you really get, uh, we got like one minute there telling me, but uh, when did you start? What, what, what triggered this for you initially? Well, I was really fortunate when I was a college student in the 1960s to walk into a classroom uh, taught by one of the greatest climate scientists of all time. I didn't major in this. It was outside my field, but I had a a chance to take a course in you know another field and this guy was a Californian Roger Ravel uh, and he was the first scientist to measure CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere everything that he said has come true he opened my eyes to this 
in the 1960s. In the, in the middle of the 70s, I went to the Congress and asked, you know, what's going on with global warming, and it was obvious nothing was. And I organized the first hearing and invited my old professor to come and be the leadoff witness, and I, I, I kind of thought naively uh, – uh, that all of my colleagues on the dais uh, listening to him would have the same epiphany that I had had. And, you know, a 20-minute congressional statement is not the same as a full course in college. And anyway, that's what got me started uh, in this. And since the 70s, I I've sort of steadily ramped up. Uh, I never expected this would, you know, kind of take over my life, but uh, but it has. And, and again, it's a privilege. It really is. And uh, anybody who has work that they really enjoy and, and gives them a feeling that they're, they're making the world a better place while they're doing it, you know what I'm saying. It's great to have that feeling that when you get up in the morning and go to work, it, it, it really justifies pouring yourself into it. Well, congratulations, and congratulations on this film, which opens on Friday. Tell everybody, and let's thank Vice President Al Gore. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to go this way, and thanks, you guys, for coming. Thank you. You have been listening to the Landmark Theater's Q&A podcast. For further in-depth discussions with filmmakers, be sure to check out our other podcast episodes from past films, and remember to subscribe for easy access to future podcasts. Thanks for listening.